What's the most dishonest musical instrument? I don't know. What's the most dishonest musical instrument? A liar. <laughs> In all honesty, I want you to shut up. What have you been up to? What crazy schemes are you plotting in that foul, depraved mind of yours? That's the theme of the Seven of Swords. Here we see a crafty looking burglar making off with five of the Seven Swords. He's probably going to sell them to buy lockpicks and a tire iron to aid him in yet more prying and jimmying. Just look at the smug expression on his wily face. He cares nothing for the poor people in the tents who are going to wake up to find they've only got two swords left. Now they'll have to take it in turns. In the key to the tarot, Arthur Edward Waite sees a man in the act of carrying away five swords rapidly. The two others of the card remain stuck in the ground. A camp is close at hand. Now we'll get to his divinatory meanings later, but he does go on to say the design is uncertain in its import because the significances are widely at variance with each other. Now this is another example of how Waite came to his accounts of the divinatory meanings. I always say that these are Waite's divinations, but that isn't entirely the case. He wasn't a huge fan of using the tarot for divination, as he saw it as a much more important key to the divine mysteries. We see it on the cover of his pictorial Key to the Tarot, where he sees being fragments of a secret tradition under the veil of divination. This is why he was a lot less involved in the minor arcana, giving Pamela Coleman Smith a lot more freedom to express what she believed the cards to represent. What Wade did for his divinatory meanings was to collate all the information from older writings of people like Court de Gebelon and Etaïla, and then try to marry those up with the formulas of the Golden Dawn. In fact, it's not a million miles away from what I'm doing here. I'm gathering information from the people I respect the most in the field, and presenting it in these videos. However, in this card, those historical writings were particularly varied, so he was at a bit of a loss when it came to putting it all together. But what we can see for certain about Pix's design is that the card shows the execution of a plan. That can be a well thought out and cunning scheme, or a hasty action that's done without really thinking it through. In either case, it usually means getting one up on someone. Now that can be for good reason, but common wisdom tells us that being open and direct is generally the best way to deal with a situation. Rachel Pollock says, here we see an image of taking action against problems. Sometimes the card means simply a daring act, even a coup that takes the sting out of the opposition. More often it stands for an impulsive act when a careful plan is required. You should be careful around stairs. Why? Because they're always up to something. <laughs> The Thoth card is very cool, not just because of the ice blue background, but also because of all the planetary symbols on the hilts of the swords. Crowley says the symbol shows six swords with their hilts in crescent formation. Their points meet below the center of the card, impinging on the blade of a much larger upthrusting sword, as if there were a contest between the many feeble and the one strong. He strives in vain. So the sword in the center is taking a bit of a beating, as it's simply outnumbered. Also, I really like his use of the term upthrusting. Crowley goes on to say there is vacillation, a wish to compromise, a certain toleration. But in certain circumstances, the results may be more disastrous than ever. Lon Milo Duquette talks about how the card illustrates a kind of celestial conflict going on. He says Harris chose to illustrate this card as a planetary battle. Six planets versus the sun. Look closely at the swords. The hilts of the six small swords arrayed in a crescent near the top of the card carry the symbols from left to right of the Moon, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Mercury and Saturn. The large central sword is the sun itself, outnumbered and battle-scarred. The Sforza of Marseille take us one step closer to the court cards by adding sword number seven. The fella on the Solar Bosca card looks like he's just emerged from the Ministry of Silly Walks. The SPQR written on the shield beneath him is an abbreviation for Senatus Populus Romanus, which translates to the Senate and people of Rome. The life willed by Seven takes on the pursuit of the One, who seems not to want his interview. Why doesn't he want his interview? The hermetic title for the Seven of Swords is Lord of Unstable Effort. The Wade Smith card shows the kind of slippery little rascal who gets up to all manner of nefarious capers and laughs while he's doing it. However, as the hermetic title for this card is Lord of Unstable Effort, hopefully he'll trip over, fall on his ass, and really bruise his tailbone. That'll learn him. He'll have to squat over the toilet for the next two weeks. The title of the Thoth card is Futility, so that could amount to the same thing. A plan that fails. Look before you leap is a phrase that comes to mind. They could both be referring to mental instability. If we do things out of anger and ill will, then our plans could very easily end in futility. The Seven of Swords corresponds to the Aquarius zodiac sign and is ruled by the Moon. 
The cosmic water boys walking on the moon this time. The Aquarius sign is known for being very clever and independent, but also has a sensitive side. The moon is also quite sensitive and relates to our emotions, desires and things beneath the surface. Now when we put the two together, that can manifest itself as a curious, innovative and social combination. However, it can also represent someone who pushes their feelings down and has a tendency to conceal them. This fits well with the Seven of Swords in the sense that the character is keeping his true intentions hidden and staying isolated from other people. Seven of Swords celebrities include Grammy Award winning singer-songwriter Carol King, Goodfella Joe Pesci and inventor of the light bulb Thomas Edison. Get a load of those eyebrows. You'd think he might have invented something to sort that out. The Seven of Swords resides in the world of Yetzirah and sits at the seventh Sephira of Netzach on the Pillar of Mercy. Sadly, the card sits at the seventh Sephira of Netzach, which means victory. So we might get away with it after all, the dirty little sword fancier. Anyway, we're still in the airy world of Yetzirah, which is the world of formation. Netzach is the Sephira of intuition, sensitivity and feelings. We're quite low down on the tree of life here and at the bottom of the pillar of mercy. So we're already a little bit unbalanced. But when we find Netzach in the intellectual world of Yetzirah, those feelings and emotions can potentially become destructive. The kind of thing that might make someone do something that's rather impulsive and somewhat ill thought out. These are all things to bear in mind when this card comes up in a reading. According to Israel Regardi, the Sefer Yetzirah calls Netzach the occult intelligence. Its colour is green, being derived from the union of the blue and yellow of Hesed and Tiferas, and its tarot cards are the four sevens. The Seven of Swords herb is Wood Betony. This herb can be used for all manner of nervous afflictions. Can you perform under pressure? Nah, but I'll have a go at Bohemian Rhapsody. <laughs> but what does it all mean? The Seven of Swords is a card of dishonesty, cunning and keeping ourselves hidden away from other people. It relates to those times when we feel inclined to tell fibs and deceive everybody. Of course that works both ways, so it can equally be about us being cheated or betrayed. And that includes those times when we try to deceive ourselves. Wade says design, attempt, wish, hope, confidence. Also quarrelling, a plan that might fail, annoyance. So we talked earlier about how Wade was trying to juggle the historical divinations for this one, but I think his meanings hold up quite well. Especially the annoyance part. There's no shortage of that round here. Anyway, Rachel Pollock had a solid idea for the meaning of this one. She says the card implies schemes and actions that do not solve anything. Not as obvious, but sometimes more important is the sense of isolation involved. He's acting alone, unable or unwilling to get anyone's help. In a relationship sense, this is pretty obvious. Either us or our partner could be getting up to fruity shenanigans. Secrets and lies are the order of the day here. People in the shadows engaging in sly love with midnight creepers. They're at it like rabbits again. However, the card incorporates all sorts of treachery, so it's not just about having it away with the delivery guy. Rachel Pollock goes on to say, going a step further, this card can indicate craftiness, but with the flaw of habitually hiding, often for no real reason, one's true plans or intentions. I think this ties in with the idea of lying to ourselves. Not only is that a pointless thing to do, but we all know that eventually the tower will come along and blow the whole nonsense away. In a career sense, it can mean trying to get one up on a co-worker, possibly by spreading scandalous rumours about them. Letting it casually slip out in the coffee break that Brenda in accounts gets up to all sorts with a pair of oven gloves and a fish finger. That should get you the promotion. The card can also indicate suspicion. Has someone been helping themselves to your homemade shellfish and spinach volivants that you keep in the communal fridge? Maybe you're ready to confront Walter, the office manager, who's putting on weight and smells vaguely of clams. Finally, the Seven of Swords connects to the idea of spying on people, so watch out. That guy over the road with the binoculars probably isn't bird watching. This card tells you that after making a fortune in commerce, you will retire to the countryside. Yes, that's another one of Eteyila's predictions that I'll believe when it happens. If you read the card for a lady, this card tells her that she will soon have a child, but then this tarot must be found. And what if it isn't? He doesn't say. Does anyone else think that sounds really sinister? The reverse Seven of Swords can indicate a move away from silent plotting and into a spirit of openness and clear communication. Wade says reversed, good advice, counsel, instruction, slander, babbling. Babbling. There's a good interpretation of the reverse card. You can't expect a crafty plan to succeed if you keep babbling about it. The good advice and counsel that he mentions also makes perfect sense. I think a good way of looking at the upside down six is dealing with our issues by actually talking to people about them. 
Rachel Pollock says the isolation turns around to become communication, in particular seeking advice on what to do about one's problems. If it appears in the reverse, it predicts you will not benefit from the wise advice given to you with regards to a marriage. See, you should have listened to your mother. She told you it was no good. The big takeaway from the Seven of Swords is deception. Now that can mean other people lying to us, or it can be us trying to pull the wool over someone else's eyes. But the most futile form of deception is when we try to deceive ourselves. If we've got problems, it's much better to deal with them directly and be open with people about them instead of hiding them away and just lying to ourselves. Dostoevsky once said, above all, don't lie to yourself. The man who lies to himself and listens to his own lie comes to a point that he cannot distinguish the truth within him or around him and so loses respect for himself and others. And having no respect, he ceases to love. Hold on to your swords. There's ne'er-do-wells creeping about. May the coming days bring you vigilance and a watchful eye. Until next time.